Okay, welcome. Welcome to this new year. Welcome to this fifth class, to this fifth year in your school. A lot of lasts will be in this year for you. Uh, last time you start the year, last lesson, last exam, last entering the school as a student, but I hope there will be also a, little, a lot of, of firsts in this year. <coughs> I will try to bring you new technologies, first time you take a look at this or that new technology. It will be an exciting year, I can just tell you, uh, enjoy your final year at this school. I know it's stressy with this final exam and matura and so on, but still, it is your last year. It is the last year of this important part of your life before you, I don't know, start military service or Red Cross or university study or your first serious job. So enjoy this last year. Uh, it, is, it is important and uh, if I think back to my last year at the HTL, uh, it was a lot of fun and I can, just can tell you to try to have a little bit of fun too. For this, for this course, for this combination, of course, because we will see each other in the C Sharp course and in the mobile computing course, I've put together um, um, a content concept that I would like to lay out in this first lesson. I would like to describe how we will organize the course and what will be the content of this course and how these two courses work intertwined because I have tried to come up with a set of technology where you don't have to learn too much new things for both courses. We will try to use synergy effects as much as possible so that you can reuse the things that you learn in this course and the other course and vice versa. Okay? But before, before we go into that, let's quickly take a look uh, at the organizational parts of this course. I think we can make this one pretty short because we already know each other. We know each other from last year, and essentially the organizational stuff works just like last year. Let's take a look. Good. Course organization. Um, yes, we will do it in English. Uh, you have probably already recognized that I'm talking English again, so it will be clear content language integrated learning. Same rules as last year. I will speak English. If you want to speak English too, you are very much invited to do so. For exams, of course, we will do everything in German. You can ask questions in English, you can ask questions in German. If you don't understand anything that I say, please interrupt me and you can repeat things in German. That's important, okay? Any questions? Probably not. Good. Next one. Yes, there is an online course calendar. Let's quickly take a look at the online course calendar. Uh, by the way, uh, these slides are hosted not on GitHub, but in Azure, why? You will learn about that in a second. Um, this is the URL for the mobile computing course. The C-sharp course is still hosted on GitHub. But this is the URL of the slides in, um, in Azure websites. And there you have the link to the online course calendar. It's in Git. And here you will see that, yeah, we have in total four written exams. One uh, at the end of October, one at the end of December. Yes, it is by design that the written exam, the second one, is pretty far away from the end of the semester. I want to free you from having a stressful time at the end of the semester. Yes, we will do the exams pretty early to be able to finish the uh, grade of the semesters at a, at a pretty early stage. Uh, we will do a written exam at the beginning of the um, second semester and we will do one written exam at the end of the second semester, somewhere in the middle of, um, of April. You already have some dates for optional oral exam if you want or need some and I've already entered all the written exams in web UTIS. So, yeah, that's the organizational stuff. If you find out that one of the dates that I picked is not good for you because you are away or because it is not convenient, then please let me know, okay? I ask your other teachers, um, especially um, mobile computing and, and Java, to take a look at the exam dates and make sure that their exams are somehow aligned to these, six, to these exams that I picked. For the C-sharp part, the slides can be found here. 
the same as last year, if not HTL dash mobile dash computing, but HTL dash C sharp. And then you have the same chapter. And here you also have an online course calendar. It's essentially the same, but the written exams are one week earlier. So we have in one week the C sharp test, and in the next week we have the mobile computing test. And you will see today, when I lay out the content concept of this course, that many of the things that you learn in one course can be used in the other course. So don't worry that these things are directly one week after the other. You will definitely benefit from in, in one exam from the other exam because the things that you learn here must be applied here and the other way around. Take a look at the dates. I think it doesn't make sense to read them out loud. You can check it on your own. Course material is on GitHub. Course slides are online. The C sharp course slides are pretty much done. They are there. The examples are pretty much done uh, for the first semester. For the second semester, I still have to do some updates, but I will do that uh, during the course of the year. For the mobile computing stuff, the content is also pretty much done, but it's not converted into web-based slides already. So I have all the content ready because this is the content that I also cover in professional talks in, in my professional life. But I have them in PowerPoint and I would like to take the opportunity to convert them to web-based slides. So therefore, the content of the slides for mobile computing, they will come step-by-step step over the course of the year. Okay? But you can be sure. Whenever we cover a topic in the lesson, or whenever you have to do some homework about the topic, the slides will be here. Let's take a quick look at the official curriculum, at the layout plan, and let's take a look what we have to cover according to the layout plan, to the curriculum. If you take a look at the ninth semester, this is the first semester of the fifth year, uh, we have to focus very much on server-based distributing, distributing systems. The networking part is not my part. You have a separate, uh, a splitted class here, so the network part will be covered by Mr. Opitz? Yes, right? yeah. Exactly. So uh, I don't even talk to Mr. Opitz. So he, uh, we, we both will try to, to somehow coordinate what we do. So for instance, we decided when it comes to um, more complex server applications to cover Docker. I will tell you more about that later on. That he will cover the more networking related stuff and I will cover the more development related stuff. So with this, it goes hand in hand. And again, we will try to make sure that you don't have to learn too many completely new technologies, but everything is, is based on a, on a very relevant but common set of core technologies. So, as you can see here, we will see we will have in the ninth semester a lot of um, server-side stuff in the mobile computing space. However, I also discussed it with your other teachers, and we decided that we mix in a little bit of mobile UI too. So we will write some native mobile apps in the first semester, um, although it's not directly mentioned here in the Leaflam, but you will see that if we talk about distributed systems, the UI is also relevant. It will not be a deep dive, we will not focus very much on Android or, or iOS, but we will definitely do a little bit of mobile development. It's called mobile computing. And for the second semester, again, uh, it's about distributed computing, complex distributed computing. To be honest, we will not go into so complex systems. We will keep it simple to medium, relatively complex, let's see. Current development platforms, definitely. We will minimize the old stuff as much as possible and we will really try to focus on new things, on current technologies, okay? And we should cover um, software quality because here it is mentioned that we should be able to implement and put into production and structured testing. So we will talk about automated testing and things like that. This is the stuff that we have to cover uh, according to the Lipa. Necessary software will be later on. How we will structure our lessons? Well, we will do lightning talks again, then we will do a little bit of theory, and then we will do a lot of, um, a lot of exercises and live demos and things like that. Lightning talks. Yes, we have lightning talks again, just like last year. I don't need to describe it. Seven minutes, some interesting technologies. 
I updated my suggestion list. So if we take a look at the mobile computing stuff, you will see that the suggestion list consists of a large number of mobile development related talks. If something is interesting, take it. You also have some ideas about code quality, about architecture, about openness in development, about general IT. Um, and at the end of the day, I also have a lot of books again. I updated my book list uh, with, uh, with some books I read recently. For instance, I very much enjoyed the Murderbot Diaries if you are into science fiction. I really love that one, or The First Man, um, or NSA, it's a German book by Andreas Eschbach, very interesting when it comes to security, especially nowadays um, when we talk about democracy and online and things like that, very interesting book and head on, um, it's, it's also quite good, it's called John Scalzi also, uh, always has, has really good books. So if you want to talk about the book, remember, no spoilers. Just make the book interesting for us all to read them. Uh, don't uh, tell us about the ending of the book. That would be not fear for you, from you, okay? Please, do not take a lightning talk that you did last year. Please avoid lightning talks that we already had last year. This would be boring, okay? Please do not take the same lightning talk for mobile computing and C-sharp. I will recognize that, and it, again, will be boring. It's perfectly fine, don't get me wrong. If you are really into one topic, and it's perfectly fine to do the same topic in both lightning talks, but then you have to cover a different aspect or take a look at it from a different angle, that's perfectly fine for me, okay? And then it's okay, but don't just reread the same text that you did in, uh, in one course directly in the other. In the C-sharp stuff, of course I also uh, let's take a look first at the curriculum before we go into the lightning talks. Uh, the curricul curriculum for the C-sharp course is essentially software architectures for distributed, uh, for distributed systems, plan <laughs> cross-platform development is here a very important aspect. Um, and again, current programming techniques, communication between heterogeneous systems, uh, internationalization, optimization, system tests, employment, things like that. And in the 10th semester, um, we get an additional topic, it's about UI. How to implement modern UIs. And that's that's the, a very important part here, and we will have to cover that. I will tell you in a second how we will do that, and how we will um, structure, structure the content. About the technology later on, lightning talks, um, suggestion list, bunch of C-sharp and .NET related sessions or topics if you want and the rest is uh, similar but not identical to the mobile computing stuff. The book list is identical. So take a look at these um, suggestions. If you like one, take one. If you don't like all of them, you always have the possibility to, to suggest different topics. If you have a different topic that is at least closely, not, not closely, at least a little bit related to what we do here in C-sharp or mobile computing, feel free to suggest this topic, it will be fine. Also, if you have some interesting books that you read and that, again, are technology related, that are related a little bit to the topics that we cover here in the courses, I'm fine with that. Um, I will not accept Fifty Shades of Grey as a book for writing talks, uh, and I think you get it. Good. Yeah, lightning talk rating just as last year. Uh, exams just as last year. Homeworks, yes, there will be homeworks. Same rules as last year. Everybody has to do homework. It's important. Please do it from the very first day on. I want to have at least your best try. If you can't do the homework because you have technolo technological difficulties, I need to see at least what you tried. Because if I don't see what you try and if I don't understand your problems, I can't help you, okay? The only thing where you get negative points is if you hand in nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's no problem. If you hand in something and you send me an email or write a GitHub issue that says, I didn't finish it, because I had this and that problem. 
because then we can discuss it, then I can send you an email, or we can discuss it uh, in the lesson, or maybe out of the lesson, whenever. That's the important one. If you hand in good homeworks, or if you uh, take an opportunity that I give you to earn extra points, you can earn up to two extra points per homework. Same as last year. Grading, same as last year. 80 points for four written, uh, four written exams, 10 points for the lightning talk, 10 points for the homework, and up to 20 points for an oral exam. If you do an oral exam, your 100% base will grow to 120 points, otherwise it will be 100 points. It's, I mean, it's clear. And this is the typical grading scheme that you are used to. I think everybody here in school does the same grading scheme. That's it. Any questions regarding the organizational stuff? Probably not. I could have summarized it with just one sentence. Same as last Okay? Please send me your, or send in your lightning talk pics by sending uh, GitHub pull requests. Okay? Just as last year. If you are struggling with that, you should uh, send me an email, but I would really very much encourage you to send me yeah. um, a GitHub pull request. If it is somehow possible, maybe you can coordinate yourself a little bit so that, that I don't get the same topic three or four or five times. I will try to sort out any kind of difficulties. I'm fine if one topic is covered by multiple persons, but then we have to coordinate that the different presenters, they, they cover the topic from a different angle. Then it's fine for me. But maybe if two people want to use the same technology or want to talk about the same technology, maybe we can sort it out and find a different interesting topic. Good? Are we fine with that? Fine. Uh, for the C-sharp part, we have the same slides. It's the same. Good. Let's spend the rest of this first lesson talking about what we will do content-wise in this course. Let me zoom in a little bit and talk about this image. This image should visualize the concept that I came up with during your holidays. I struggled a little bit. I was thinking about what should we do in this course? What should we do? What should I cover? And things like that. And I had two options. I could go for the latest and greatest and coolest and most sexy stuff, technologies like Flutter and Go and Rust and so on, and I decided to not go down that road. It would have been super interesting, but it would have been uh, horrible in terms of your end exam, final exam at the end of the year. So what I decided is I decided for one course we don't have an option, we have to cover C-sharp because it's part of the official curriculum in the school. I decided to go all in to C-sharp and use C-sharp throughout both courses. That gives you the opportunity to get really an in-depth knowledge about this language. It's a very useful knowledge. If you are a good C-sharp developer, you will have absolutely no problem finding a lot of job opportunities. It's a very valuable option because C-sharp is mostly used in enterprise environments and in enterprise environments you can earn a lot of money. C-sharp can also be used on all platforms. We'll talk about that in the second, uh, in the second hour. So C-sharp can be used to build mobile apps, can be used to build server apps, can be used to build, I don't know, apps or TV sets. It can be broadly applied, okay? So I decided to go C-sharp all in and of course .NET all in. However, we can take a look at the newest, sexy, coolest stuff made in the lightning talks. I would love to see a lightning talk about Flutter, for instance, as a brand new and super hot mobile development and web development platform from Google. I would love to see, for instance, a lightning talk about Go or Rust or other upcoming languages which are skyrocketing in terms of um, in terms of the number of developers who really look into these languages. So let's use the lightning talks to look into, get a glimpse into uh, the things that are used by, I don't know, Silicon Valley startups. And in the course, I will teach you the practically applicable knowledge that you can use today in the existing economy, in the existing economy of software development here in Austria. So when you leave this school at the end of this year, you have, you have valuable knowledge that will help you find a job, find an interesting job, and be 
being very innovative in this field. Good. So now let's talk about the different uh, aspects. In C Sharp, in Posit, we will start with C Sharp and the whole .NET stuff. I will avoid the old .NET framework stuff as much as possible. The official curriculum says we should use current development technologies. So forget about the history stuff. I will tell you about the history and why things are as they are, but we will not take a look at it. We are lucky because on September 23rd, .NET Core 3.0 comes out. And with .NET 3.0, we get support for WPF as a UI technology on top of .NET Core. So even for the UI stuff, we don't need to bother with the old .NET framework stuff anymore. And that's great. So we can build everything on the new technology, on the latest version of C-Sharp, on the latest version of .NET Core. Therefore, we need to understand C-Sharp and .NET Core, and this will be the first thing in the post world. In the mobile computing world, maybe you can remember, we have a pretty strong focus on the server part, and we have a pretty strong focus on interoperability and heterogeneous systems, and there, of course, we have the topic of web APIs. I know what you know about web APIs from last year, because we did that together. Last year, we wrote web APIs using Node.js and Express, and I hope you you haven't forget, you haven't got everything over the course of the holidays, so maybe you can remember things like REST APIs and paths and HTTP headers and things like that, because this general concept, you will need it this year again. But this year we will not implement these, these framework or these APIs with Node, but we will implement it with C sharp. So what you learn here in Posa, you will immediately be able to apply it here in the uh, MV in the mobile computing space because there we will start by using ASP.NET Core Web APIs. Every single company that I work with nowadays uses some part, some kind of web APIs, and many of them, the majority of them are also using ASP.NET Core. ASP.NET Core is really a very good platform for uh, building web APIs, and therefore I think this is a, a good way to combine these two courses <coughs> at the same time. And it gives you a kind of context. We don't need to study theory here without any application. We study theory here, we learn about the language, but then it's boring if you don't apply this language. And we will by developing web APIs. Next step. On the positive part will be Entity Framework. Entity Framework is, is a way of accessing databases. Databases with an object relational mapper. And databases are an important part whenever you implement software nowadays. So we'll try to access databases from C Sharp and .NET with the Entity Framework. And guess what? Once we learn about Entity Framework, we can immediately apply it to the ASP.NET Core Web APIs to build web APIs with it with backend. Okay? Good. In the mobile computing part, I told you that we, we decided to go a little bit into native development, but I don't want to do native native development because then we would have to invent new you know, or learn completely new languages or uh, use languages that I am not familiar with, like Java. Um, therefore, <laughs> I, I decided to go for the C-sharp way of writing mobile apps. And there we are lucky because there is a framework which is called Xamarin Forms. I will tell you more about Xamarin in a few minutes. Xamarin Forms is a way of building native apps, not browser-based apps, native apps with great performance that can of course be put in any kind of, of app store with C-sharp. And the good thing for the forms, uh, for Xamarin Forms, is that even the UI part can be written in a cross-platform way. So if you build an app for iOS and Android, you just write it once. You write the UI once, you write the logic once, it's the same to access, I don't know, the accelerometer, for instance, or the GPS. You just write one code, and you immediately have it on both platforms. The reason why I do that is, well, first, we can reuse the knowledge that we have here. We can reuse the web APIs that we build here. We can reuse the things that we learn up, up here to a certain degree. And the nice thing is that Xamarin Forms uses a language which is called XAML, XML Application Market Language. Remember what we did last year in Angular? In Angular, we had this template language. 
with this banana and box binding and this interpolation stuff, it was HTML what we did there. What is HTML? XML. Well, the sample is very, very similar to what you have learned in Angular. It looks a little bit different, but it has data binding and all these concepts that you have learned last year already. And the beautiful thing is, if we cover XAML here, we can use exactly the same XAML here. Because the next step in the POSERT world is UI. WPF has, since its invention, been a great platform to develop desktop applications. I wrote books about it, I love it, it's really a great piece of technology. And with .NET Core 3, it is, it is lifted to a new .NET Core world. And how do you implement WPI UIs, WPF UIs? With XAML. So again, we can learn, we can spend time here to learn about XAML and apply this knowledge immediately here. Less time for you to learn. Okay, the, the controls have a little bit different names, but I'm pretty sure that you will be able to handle that. It's even possible to take XAML forms and compile it to WPF. So you can write one solution that runs on iOS, Android, and on your Windows PC as an app or as a WPF app. We will not go down that road. We have too, little, too less time for that. But still, it would be a possible option. In the mobile computing space, you have seen that in the second semester, we again have a strong focus on the server side, but also on cloud computing. And I was struggling again during the holidays. What should I do with you? Should I show you the, the cloud platform that I am most familiar with and use every single day, Azure? But what if you go into a company that uses Amazon, or uses Google, or uses Hetzna, or has their own private cloud, or whatever? That's a problem. So I decided to go into the abstraction layer, and I decided to go with you into the world of Docker. We'll take a look at Docker. As a, as a container platform, and the beauty of Docker is you can run it locally, you can run it in Azure, in AWS, Amazon, in, in the Google Cloud, you can run it in a private cloud, you can run it on Hetzna, you can run it on a standalone server, you can run it on a Raspberry Pi, it simply runs everywhere. So again, remember what I told you about the general principles that I would like to apply, broadly applicable knowledge. And this is what Docker is all about. Build containers, and run it in any cloud, independent of whether it is a public cloud or a private cloud. I also discussed with Mr. Opitz that he will cover Docker too. So therefore, in the networking part, you will talk about Docker fundamentals, you will talk about Docker networking and all this stuff. Don't worry, it's not that complicated. It's simpler that, uh, than working with some Cisco or whatever routers. It's much simpler. Um, but still, it is a very interesting topic, so we will cover the networking part and we will primarily focus on the software development part on Docker. Okay? And again, we will try to apply things. We will take our ASP.NET Core Web APIs, we will host it in Docker containers, we will run this Docker container somewhere in the cloud, and then we will use our Xamarin apps to access the web APIs that run in the Docker container. So we will try to bring all the things together. Good? Good. The last thing, the last quarter of this year, uh, it will be pretty near to your final exams. So therefore, maybe my courses will not be the most important things on your mind at the end of the year. I'm fully aware of that. So therefore, um, I put two, let's say, more horizontal topics at the end of the year. Software quality on the left-hand side. We will use software quality in the c -sharp course to repeat a lot of things, to recap things. So we, again, write, for instance, unit tests. How will we write unit tests? In C Sharp. You have the opportunity to practice C Sharp. We will write unit tests for uh, web APIs. Again, what can you practice? Web APIs. We will run this unit tests in Docker containers. What can you practice? Docker. I think you get the idea, OK? It will not be a stressful last written exam. The rest, the last written exam will not be the most complicated one. Um, we, I'm fully aware that at the end of the year, my topics are not that important for you. Preparing for the final exam will be more important. In the mobile computing part, uh, we have the topic of cloud computing. Um, I, we, we don't have subscriptions for all of you where you can spend a lot of money spinning up 
expensive virtual machines doing crazy stuff. We don't have that. So therefore, I have to show you some things in, in my subscriptions. We will try some experiments, but again, it will be more more relaxed. It will not be the hardcore theory when you have to practice a lot. Okay? <coughs> that's that's the essentially the idea for, for the whole course. So this is C sharp, this is mobile computing, they are intertwined. I will try to reuse as much um, concepts and languages and platforms as possible to reduce the new things. And we'll, we, we, this gives us the opportunity to go deeper and not just broad. Good? Any questions concerning the general concept of this course? Anything that you absolutely dislike? In the last class, somebody said, yes, it's in short. <laughs> I can't help you, I'm very sorry. <laughs> I will try to do my very best to make you love C sharp. If I fail, well, then you have made you learn new reasons why you hate C sharp. But I personally think it's a really good language and .NET is a really good place to be in. So stay open, give it a try. Anything else that you, I hope many of you like C sharp, anything that you dislike, that you would like to cover? Nice, nice, nice. Before we go start um, talking about content, and we will talk uh, a little bit about .NET and .NET Core and how it works today, um, I would like to discuss the homework. Yes, there is homework, and there is a reason why I'm. I would like to talk about the homework first. Um, the homework is already in your web notes. The link to the homework. Let me quickly open it, it's here. <coughs> okay, so the homework, the topic, the theme of the homework is setting up technical prerequisites. Last year we covered Node.js and Angular. Let's see. We covered Node.js and Angular. The good thing about Angular and Node.js was that it nearly had no prerequisites. You can simply install Node.js, you can simply install any editor that you like, for instance Visual Studio Code, it runs everywhere, it just works. Well, this year we have some topics that are a little bit more complex. Why? If we do mobile development, we need some kind of development environment. We need emulators, or we need to connect our phones with our laptops in order to be able to do some debugging. That's the first thing. And the second thing is we, we will use Docker. And Docker is something that has to do with virtualization technology. So setting up the prerequisites for this course is not as easy as last year, and therefore we will spend um, one homework solely dedicated to prerequisites. Um, I am not sure whether we have a cover lesson for my absence today in the afternoon, or whether you simply have free time. Free time. Okay, then you have additional two hours to work on this uh, on this exercise. Maybe you do it here together, or maybe at home. I don't, I don't mind, but definitely uh, you will not get anything to do for this afternoon lessons. So just use this time to work on this homework. With that, you will probably not have to spend much time uh, on top of that. So let's talk about what you have to do. If you want to follow the easy path, the path where you just have to do some download, some installers, double click, next, 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 finish, lean back, have a cup of coffee, next download, next, 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 finish. If you want to go down this part, it will be very relaxed. Everything will work easy. However, you need Hyper-V. On Windows, Hyper-V is deeply integrated into the, into the operating system and Docker and the emulators on Windows, they rely on Hyper-V. I know that in other courses, for some topics, you need, you need VMware. And luckily, VMware works great on servers, but it's not the preferred way of virtualizing things on, on a Windows machine. So, you can't run VMware and Hyper-V at the same time on the same computer. Okay? I'm very sorry about that. So, two possibilities. Either you say, 
I'm fine, I don't need VMware absolutely, or I don't need VMware all the time. You can temporarily disable the first one, reboot your laptop and take the, the second one. Um, if, you, if you manage to, to turn on Hyper-V and the link is here, it's really just sending two boxes and clicking OK, then, every, then the rest of this exercise will be a piece of cake. If you decide that you have to use VMware and you cannot enable Hyper-V for instance, then you still, of course, can participate in this course and do all the exercises, but it will be kind of a rough ride. You will have to do some manual installation steps. I'm perfectly fine with that. If you love tweaking around with your laptop, that's perfectly fine for you. You can do that. There is another option for those of you who are who have enough space on their disks and maybe a solid state disk where they have, I don't know, 100 gigs free or something like this. You can also use boot to VHD, it's a feature of Windows. With that you can create a virtual hard disk and you can boot your laptop into the virtual hard disk. So you have a second operating system, a second Windows system on your computer, boot into it and then you boot into the VHD for the stuff where you use Hyper-V and then you shut down and boot into your normal system if you use VMware. That's another option, okay? Decide yourself. For mobile development, I told you, Xamarin. The easiest way of implementing Xamarin solutions, uh, any Mac uses here? No, okay. The easiest way of implementing uh, Xamarin solutions is Visual Studio. And I told you, I will try to avoid all stuff. So we will need Visual Studio 2019. I even encourage you to use Visual Studio 2019 preview. Okay? Let's be um, on the edge, okay? So let, let's give it a try. Let's always be one version ahead of the things that other people do who rely on just just productive system. So install the 2019 preview. If you need the, another version of Visual Studio 2017 or 2019 production, that's perfectly fine. Okay, install the 2019 preview side by side to other versions of the Visual Studio um, development environment. Okay, 2019 important and also important. Install these um, these workloads. Okay, at least these. You need more? That's no problem. But you need these ones. It's perfectly fine if you use the free community edition of Visual Studio. If you have access to the Enterprise Edition, that's perfectly fine. But I, I think some of you have, or all of you have, I don't know. But the community edition is perfectly fine. It's enough, and it's free. It's officially free, and it's not just free for 30 days. It's free for any kind of academic purposes, so you can use it. If you go for the production version of 2019, please install the .NET Core 3 SDK. If you go for the preview version, you will get it automatically. Good. So this is what you have to install. Once you have installed that, we need an emulator because we are going to develop mobile apps. It's sufficient if you install the Android emulator. We will not do iOS development. Why? Uh, I cannot, I don't assume or I cannot assume that everybody has an iPhone, but most of you probably have Android, right? Is that correct to assume? Yeah, so, yeah. okay, I guess, I guess it's like that. If you have iOS, feel free to, to install the iOS tools too, but I will not cover it in this, in this course. I'm an Android user myself, uh, I have an iPad, but I'm really much more familiar with Android than, than with iOS. The emulator is a good way to test and develop your applications locally without using a phone. If you cannot or you don't want to install an emulator, by the way, the emulator is only really good performance-wise if you run it hardware accelerated in Hyper-V mode. This is another reason why we need Hyper-V. But if you don't want or can't install the emulator, feel free to enable on-device debugging. If you have a rather current Android version, you can enable device debugging, then plug in your device, and then from Visual Studio, debug the app running on your phone, and still you can develop in Visual Studio. Both options are fine for me, okay? Absolutely fine. Last but not least, Docker. Again, if you want to have an easy ride, install Docker Desktop. It's downloading an installer, click, 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 finish, done. It just works if you have Hyper-V. If you don't have Hyper-V, you can't install Docker Desktop because it's deeply integrated into Hyper-V. 
then you can try if you want the old Docker machine stuff. It's, it's the older version of Docker Desktop. I would not recommend it. If you really don't uh, want to install Docker Desktop or Hyper-V, I encourage you to set up manually a Linux VM, Ubuntu, Debian, whatever you prefer, and install Docker Community Edition. Again, free Community Edition, the open source version, not the commercial version. Inst install it manually to this Linux VM and throughout this course, use your manually created and maintained Linux VM, okay? It will work. It will require a little bit of attention and you will have to spend a little bit of time fiddling around with network settings and things like that, but still, it works, okay? Finally, once you have installed it, we will use through the course, through this course, a bunch of uh, so-called Docker images, what are Docker images, you will learn that later on in this year. And I encourage you to pull down these Docker images up front. Some of them are some hundred megs, no gigabyte wise stuff, a few hundred megs, something like this. But still, um, if you want to start with your homework and you have to download three images, which all have, I don't know, 300 megs, it takes a while. So I encourage you to download all of these images once you have set up Docker. So if you want to follow the easy path, enable Hyper-V, install Visual Studio 2019 preview, check boxes for the five workloads, wait a bit, and wait a bit install Docker Desktop, next, 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 done, and you're done. And you are fully prepared for this course. But maybe at some point in time, something goes wrong. Maybe you have something you can't install, or maybe you have some incompatibilities. And this is what this homework is all about. Windows 10 Home, for example. Pardon? Windows 10 Home. Windows 10 Home is a problem. It's... You can buy an official license for Windows 10 Professional on eBay for between 5 and 10 euro. It's possible. There are um, license keys available. It's a second-hand software. You can take a look at eBay and they send their official dealers from Germany. Um, there, there is still a little bit of discussion going around whether this is allowed or not, but currently there are official dealers on eBay from Germany where you can read the legal details why and how they sell these keys and you can download them and you can use them um, so for a few bucks you can get a Windows 10 professional so that shouldn't be a big showstopper. How and if you want to stick with the home edition um, follow the alternative parts without hyper. Um, how can you hand in your homework? I want to have two, not, not two, uh, three screenshots, sorry. I want to have screenshots for the Samar Informed mobile app demo. It's, it's um, mentioned below. I want to see that you can run a Docker container and I want to see that you have downloaded the, the images. Okay, just send me three screenshots in an image and you are fine. If you have any problems, send me an email where you're saying, where you're going to tell me which problems you had and what you did to overcome these problems. I need to have this feedback, okay? I need to have this feedback whether only a few of you have some problems or whether most of you have problems because then I have a problem and then I have to think about an alternative solution. So it's really, really important that everybody does this homework. Yeah? The easy path should easily be done in one or two hours. Or the harder parts, paths, try it and maybe I can help you overcome any problems. Okay, now we discussed, we don't do a break, we will work through because unfortunately I have to leave early because I have to catch a plane. Okay, so we will not do a break. If somebody is hungry or wants to grab a quick cup of coffee or something like this, now is the right time to run and get a drink or get something to eat, but please come back in. Okay? Okay, now we have covered the organizational part and the content part or the content overview and we can spend the rest of the time of today's lesson to dive into the, the first topic. And the first topic is the short and, and .NET and .NET Core. I know this officially is the uh, mobile computing lesson today, but because I am absent in the afternoon, I switched it around. 
So we will focus on a C-sharp topic in the morning and in the afternoon you can use the time to work on your uh, homework and set up Xamarin, the emulator and Docker. Okay, so this is the reason why. Good. First question to you. If you, if you work in a company and this company does not use C-sharp and .NET a lot or has never used it and they have no idea what this stuff is. Maybe they use Python or JavaScript. And they ask you, what is this C-sharp, the .NET stuff all about? What do you say? What are characteristics of C-sharp and .NET that come to your mind? Maybe in comparison to other languages, many more regular, or similarities. Any ideas? Compare it, for instance, with JavaScript. Where are the differences? Isn't good to run browser. It's really preferred environment is the desktop and not the browser. Its preferred environment is the desktop and not the browser. Well, with JavaScript and Node.js, that's not really true. And with WebAssembly and C-sharp, that's not really true. But I know where you're heading. I would not say it's preferred environment. I would say it's traditional environment, where it comes from. Its roots are in different area. C-sharp was originally invented to build desktop apps and server apps with ASP.NET. And JavaScript was originally invented to run scripts in the browser. With that, you are perfectly correct. Today, these, these statements are not really true anymore because you can run C Sharp in the browser and you can run JavaScript out of the browser. So, but its roots are there. What else? What about typing? Is C-sharp a strongly typed language? Is JavaScript a strongly typed language? No. That's a very important difference. JavaScript has no strict typing. If you can remember it from last year, you have a variable x, it can be a number here and a string there. In C-sharp? Nope. That's not possible. Well, there is a special data type which is called dynamic that makes it dynamically typed, but by default, you have strong types. What's about TypeScript? Well, with TypeScript it's different. We have talked about that last year. TypeScript is a strong in type language. And here we have to take a little bit of a look behind the history of C Sharp. You know that the original inventor, the main inventor of C Sharp, is Mr. Anders Heilsberg. Mr. Heilsberg, come here. Mr. Heilsberg is one of the technical fellows at Microsoft. It's the highest technical career level that you can achieve in Microsoft, inside of Microsoft. And Heilsberg invented C-Sharp. A few years ago, he then took a look at the JavaScript world and what he saw didn't make him happy because he likes typed languages. And therefore, he started inventing a typed language for the browser, which is called TypeScript. <coughs> So there is the same, let's say, father of both languages, TypeScript and C-sharp, and it is Anders Hausberg. And therefore, there are a lot of similarities. There are differences, definitely. There are definitely differences, but there are also a lot of similarities. For instance, async await, which, we'll, which we already talked about in the TypeScript world. It was originally invented in C-sharp, and then it came to TypeScript probably because Anders thought it is a good idea, and I agree, it is definitely a good idea to have this language feature in both languages. So we have a, a common creator, let's put it like that. What about, yeah, questions? So, a uh, quick, quick uh, question. When uh, we Windows 10 Home hat, then we have Windows 10 Professional. Yeah, if you have a Windows 10 Home and you would like to go the easy path, then you will probably need the Windows 10 Professional. Okay. It's not a must, you can use Windows Home, but then you will have to do a lot of uh, manual installation steps. Okay. Yep. Um, if you go to bubble.hpl.ac.at and go there to Microsoft licenses, you can gain a professional 8.1 Windows license which can activate and um, at your local Windows system and uh, have Windows 10. Very good. Thank so you. That's for free. Yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. So you can get to Windows 10 Pro. Okay. okay. Good. If you ever 
uh, stumble across a talk from Anders Heisberg on YouTube, or if it happens that Anders gives a talk somewhere near here and you have the possibility to look at him, I don't care whether you, you're interested in the topic he speaks about, just go there, listen to him. He's one of the most influential persons currently living on Earth concerning software development. He was part of the Pascal team, he was part of the Delphi team, he invented two major languages, and he still can write a lot of all. Really awesome code, so Anas is a great person. So he invented those. What about Java? Are there any similarities of C sharp and Java? Or to put it differently, what is the most important similarity between Java and C sharp? Intermediate language. If you compile C sharp, you don't get machine language. You get so-called intermediate language. And the same is true for Java. If you compile Java, you get intermediate language, not machine language. The computer cannot, ex cannot execute intermediate language. Who and when turns intermediate language into machine language? You know that? You know that from Java? There is a component in both languages which is called a jitter, the just-in-time compiler. Just-in-time means that it takes the intermediate language exactly when you first execute it. It's not an interpreter. Technically, it works like this. You have, whenever you call a function, you don't have a pointer to the function to the executable code. You have a pointer into the just-in-time compiler. And when you call the function for the first time, the just-in-time compiler will kick in, compile intermediate language to machine language, and then replace the call with a call to the compiled version. So the first call to a function in C sharp is rather slow because the just-in-time compiler has to turn the, the intermediate language code into machine language code. Get the idea? This is the reason why the startup time of .NET applications are sometimes rather slow. In many cases, the reason is the just-in-time compiler. Can you get around that? Can you do so-called ahead-of-time compilation? Yes, of course you can. With .NET Framework, the, 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 the tool for that was NGEN, Native Image Generator. And for .NET Core, the tool is not in production yet. Uh, it is in, in preview. There, there is a tool to do that, but that's not ready. The important thing, intermediate language. You don't get an executable. And that's different for C++, for Rust, for Go, and other programming languages. Is it a managed language? Meaning that you don't have to free memory that you allocate, or do you have to free memory similar to, to C++, for instance? I think you can manage unmanaged code. Mm, yes, we'll not go into unmanaged code, but the default is it is a managed language. But you are absolutely right, you can do both, generally speaking. Um, it's a managed language with managed memory, so you do not have to free code, uh, free memory once you allocate it. That raises the web of productivity. Okay. So let me quickly check when. Uh, yeah, is .NET a language that is generally usable for many different kinds of applications, or is it a language that is focused on a certain, let's say, problem domain or business domain? It is a generally usable language. You can build business apps, you can build UI apps, you can build mobile apps, you can build server-side applications, you can do data science with C Sharp, um, you can run it on a Raspberry Pi or a huge multi-core machine in a kind of cloud data center. It's a generally applicable language. You can even write professional games. If you use Unity, for instance, you will write your game logic in C Sharp. Having a generally usable language has some advantages because you learn one language and you can apply your knowledge to many different problem domains. But it also has some disadvantages because it is a generally usable language. It is not focused on a certain problem like R for machine learning. It is generally applicable. For some, for that, some people that's an advantage for some. It's a disadvantage. Good. Yeah, this one. Are there more programming languages for .NET than just C-sharp? 
Well, definitely, yes, you can see it at the last bullet point here. There are many .NET programming languages. Not all .NET developers are C-sharp developers. People use Visual Basic, people use F-sharp, people use COBOL, people use many, many different languages. I think there are more than 100 languages on top of .NET. So you have options. Typically, the easiest way is to use C-sharp if you want to go for .NET. But many people, maybe because of historical reasons or because they like other programs, the programming languages more, they use different languages. Okay. Does it make sense to use C-sharp without .NET? No. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the history of .NET. At the very beginning, I don't know, 20 years ago or so, the, the thing was called .NET Framework. And .NET Framework, now this is an important one, was platform dependent, Windows only. It was a product from Microsoft, which they sold or bundled with their Windows operating system. It was closed source, nobody had the source codes of, of .NET. The only thing that was open and an open standard was the C-sharp language specification. So C-sharp was always a standard available to the broad public, open source if you want, not the compiler, but the language standard. But .NET was a product, a product proprietary from Microsoft. A few years ago, I don't know, seven years, I, I don't have the, the exact number of years on the top of my mind, uh, Microsoft took a look at what they had with .NET Framework. And they looked around and saw platforms like, for instance, Node.js. Node.js was faster. It was more innovative because they were open source. It ran on all platforms. And platforms like Node.js, they, they, they really they really conquered territory from c -sharp. So people started to use different programming languages and frameworks, and Microsoft, of course, they looked like that. And so they thought about, what can we do? They, they also took a look at this language, and maybe you know that from your personal history, if you write a little bit of code, and then you maintain this code for a longer piece of time, then you add something here, and then you add something here, and then you learn new approaches, and then you add something here, which is with a different approach, and then you add something here, and at the end you have this Frankenstein monster that consists of many different um, libraries and approaches and patterns, and maybe there is this code that you really don't like to look at anymore because it is embarrassing the kind of code that you have written three years ago and now you have this great new code that you are not happy with this stuff. The same was true for Microsoft. At some point in time, after 15 years or so, they took a look at .NET Framework and they said, okay, we have done, we have done some good decisions, but we have also done some really bad decisions. We went into directions that weren't good ideas Maybe we should have taken different paths. Maybe we have 15 different solutions for one problem inside of the .NET framework, and it simply was a mess. I think the picture of a Frankenstein monster was correct at that point in time. So what they did is they said, OK, we want to take the, the, the Node.js's of this world head on, and we really want to be cool and sexy and fast and up to date and clean. This is what we want to do. And what they did is they invented .NET Core. So they took .NET, they th they've thrown away everything that were not good ideas. And then they, they tried to restructure it, to refactor it, to make a core that is beautiful and modern and cross-platform and open source exactly like it should be in the year 2019. This was successful. This was .NET Core 1. And nerds like me, and there are some nerds on this planet, they loved it. They saw it, they loved it. For me, it was a great relief because at that point, I really had a personal crisis with .NET. I didn't know whether I would like to program .NET for many years now, but I decided to go on because of .NET Core. The problem was, there are many enterprises out there who invested tens or even hundreds of person years developing .NET Framework applications. What should they do? Now they have this .NET Core stuff and they take their .NET Framework app, they try to move it to .NET Core and they get 
thousands of errors because everything is done differently and many, many things are just not there. That's a problem. What they essentially said to Microsoft is, nice that you consider us legacy, so old stuff, but we don't care about your new stuff. If it's not fully compatible to the old .NET framework, we simply will ignore it. And that's a problem. Because there is an old saying which says, legacy software is the software that earns you money. And therefore, Microsoft needed to get these large enterprises on board. It is not enough to have .NET Core, which is, I don't know, applied by some venture capitalists founded Silicon Valley startups. It's nice, but they don't spend money. They want to have open source software. They will not pay Microsoft a single dime for .NET Framework. For enterprises, that's different, because they have support contracts and all the stuff, and with that, you can earn money. And at the end of the day, Microsoft is a commercial company. They want to earn money. So they have stuff. So, then came .NET Core 2, .NET Core 2.1, and .NET Core 2.2, and now at the September 23rd, we will have .NET Core 3. And guess what Microsoft did? Is they added more and more and more of the old stuff. Okay, they made it a little bit more beautiful, and they got rid of the most stupid ideas. No, it wasn't stupid ideas at that point in time, but the ideas that are not relevant anymore. So the word core, isn't perfectly right anymore. There was .NET Framework, and now .NET Core is pretty much very compatible with .NET Framework, but it's open source, it runs on Windows and Linux and Mac and all the different platforms, and it's just a modernized version of .NET. So if you ask today what is the future of .NET, definitely .NET Core. But because it's no longer core, it's just a refactored, modernized version of .NET. Microsoft already announced that at some point in the future, probably with .NET 5, there will not be a .NET Core anymore. They will remove the word Core because it isn't the Core anymore. So they will try, that at some point in time, they diverge into two different worlds of .NET. Currently, we are in two different worlds. One is a dead end. They don't invest anymore in the .NET framework stuff. But at some point in time, we will bring all the different .NET flavors together in .NET 5 or whatever it will be called. Okay? But this is 5 or 10 years ahead. Today, I would like you to remember one thing. It may happen that I ask you in an exam. What is .NET framework? Old, legacy. Legacy means still supported but not, not currently actively developed. Legacy, just Windows, closed source. .NET Core, New World, open source, cross-platform, not a Microsoft product anymore, it's a community product, many companies contribute to .NET Core, of course Microsoft is one of them. Good? Now, there is this strange thing here that you probably not have heard any, anything about. .NET Standard. Does anybody have an idea what .NET standard is? Okay, I, I thought so. .NET standard is a solution to the problem that if you write a library, .NET, a library, a reusable piece of business logic, and you would like your customers to use it independent of whether they use .NET framework, or .NET core, or Unity with Mono, or maybe browser version with WebAssembly, you don't want to build a library for every different flavor of .NET. You take your library with, let's say, mathematical algorithms, and you would like to compile it, and you would like to run it everywhere. That's .NET standard. So what you have to remember, this is what, what's important. The other thing is, is nice to know. Remember, if you build a class library today, don't use .NET Core. Don't use .NET Framework. Use .NET Standard. Because if you base it on .NET Standard, it can be used everywhere. This is what you have to remember for the exams, and this is the important message that you have to remember when you, once you enter the professional world of .NET development. If we take a look at this link, you will see that we currently are here in .NET Standard 2.0. So if you choose, for instance, .NET Standard 
it will run in .NET Core 1 and above. It will run on .NET Framework 4.6.1 and above. It will run on Mono 4.6, which might be interesting for you if you are into game development, because Unity might be important for you. It will run on iOS, it will run on Mac, it will run on Android. And if I scroll down, here you see the Unity version. Okay? The 2.0 version is the latest one. Here you see the compatibility. And with .NET Core 3, you will get .NET Standard 2.1. Don't worry. I will never ask you about these strange numbers. If you are deep into .NET development, you will remember them definitely because you have to deal with them every single day. The only thing that I want you to remember, I repeat myself consciously, .NET Framework, legacy, old, Windows, product, licensed, .NET Core, open source, cross-platform for apps, and .NET Standard for libraries. Okay? Reusable libraries. Anybody has a Samsung TV at home? Do you know the, the name of the operating system of the, of the, the Samsung TV? Android TV or something? Uh, Android TV is one option, but I think the native thing from, from Samsung, it's called Tyson, and they also use .NET. Samsung is a very important contributor to .NET, so it's not just Microsoft. Okay, good. <coughs> Clear what .NET Core and .NET Standard is? Let's do a quick demo to see how that works in practice. Good. Let's go here, find a new project. You don't need to follow along, just, just follow um, <coughs> what I do here on the video beamer. Let's create a very simple console app here, a .NET Core app. Uh, yes, that's fine. Let's create this one. Good. Uh, by the way, if you have such an app, I can either compile it in Visual Studio. My laptop is a little bit warm, I think it's pretty busy. Okay. Um, the thing that I want to show you is you can also run it in the, in the command line. Um, if you are in the command line, I will zoom in a little bit so you see it better. I can say .NET build to build it. That will build my app. I don't need Visual Studio for that. I can program C Sharp in any kind of editor that you like. Currently, I'm using .NET Core 3. Oh, I didn't show you that. Let me quickly go here in Visual Studio and show you that one. If I go here, this is the project file and you see, uh-huh, this is a .NET Core app 3.0. It's a command line executable and therefore I can run it with .NET Run. Similar to node name of your JavaScript file, you just say .NET Run and once my laptop has done compiling it, it says hello world, nothing special. This is a .NET Core application. Now let's add a second application here, a second project, and this time I will use a class library. And you see here it says .NET Standard, and this is the important one. It might happen at an exam that I ask you to create an app with a reusable library. For the app you take .NET Core, for the library you take .NET Standard. Good? So let's take the .NET Standard library here. Go for it. Good. And if we take a look at the class library here, and you see this is .NET Standard 2.0. See? Because it is .NET Standard 2.0, we can, here in the console app, add a reference to the class library. See that one? So now we have a reference from here, the .NET Core app, to the .NET Standard app. And now I can use the classes in the class library from .NET Core. Let's see. Here, here, here. Okay, still works. Okay. But I can also add a third project here. This time I'm going to use a console app here with .NET Framework. 
here, please note, before I took this one, console.net core, and now I will take this one, .NET Framework. The one above, it's cross-plat. It works on Linux, it works on Mac, it works on Windows. This one is Win-only. Is that perfectly true? Not perfectly true. Have you heard of Mono before? Mono is an open source implementation of .NET Framework. It was the first cross-platform app. Mono became Xamarin. And with Mono, you can even run .NET Framework apps on, on Linux, but that's a detail. Generally speaking, .NET Framework is bound to Windows. Good, let's take this one. .NET Framework. Good. And again, if we take a look at the console of 10, we now, here, unload the project and edit the csproj. You see, this project file is much more complicated. And if you see something ugly like that, that is the old .NET framework. This is how a .NET framework project file looks like. Compare that with the nice one from .NET Core. This is readable, this is writable, this is old stuff. Let's reload it. And again, I can add a reference to my class library. So now, I have a generally usable class library which I reference from .NET Framework and which I also reference from .NET Core. This is the whole reason why .NET Standard exists. Get the idea? At some point in time, when there will no longer be a .NET Core, .NET 5, the need for .NET Standard will go away. I have no idea how they will do it. It is many years away in the future. Let's see how it will work. Let's see if it works. But that's the vision. Okay? Currently, I know I repeat myself. I do that consciously. .NET Framework, old Windows stuff. .NET Core, cross-platform Linux, Windows, Mac, open source. And .NET Standard, reusable class libraries that can be used in old world and in new world. Get the idea? Remember that. Let's get back to the slides. Let's talk a little bit about Xamarin. What does Xamarin bring to the table? Xamarin, it's a platform for writing mobile apps for Android and iOS. You probably have already heard about that. The roots of Xamarin are modern. Let me tell you a story, okay? Many years ago, many, many years ago, when Microsoft invented C-Sharp and .NET, there was a group of people, especially a guy um, named Miguel de Icaza, and he looked at C-Sharp, and he fell in love with C-Sharp. However, he was a Linux guy. He loved Linux, and he, let's put it mildly, disliked Windows. He took a look at C-Sharp and said, I would like to use C-Sharp for Linux programming. The problem is that there was no C-Sharp compiler on Linux. There was no .NET Framework on Linux, but Microsoft did standardize and open the C-Sharp language specification. So what he did is he sat down, wrote his own C-Sharp compiler, wrote his own version of .NET, and just followed the official specification of what the C-Sharp language is and what the .NET framework is. So he rewrote together with a team of, of open source enthusiasts, 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 now I have it, uh, he rewrote everything from scratch. At some points in time, Microsoft was pretty rude to him. They said, if you reuse a single line of code of the official Microsoft.net code base, maybe you get it from somewhere on the internet, then we will sue you. So he, they, they really wrote everything from scratch. And it was a huge engineering, engineering effort, and it worked well. And because it worked so well on Linux, they decided to not only write Linux apps with C Sharp, but they also enjoyed writing mobile apps. So at that point in time, the team said, hey, Android is a kind of Linux. Let's take what we already have and port it to the mobile world. So it will be possible to use C-Sharp and .NET on Android and on iOS. 
you have to remember that time. You are pretty young, so I'm not sure whether you remember it. There was a time when there was a Windows phone. Can you remember that? Maybe you had one. So Microsoft wasn't that happy that somebody makes it easy to run .NET and C-sharp on Android and iOS because they wanted C-sharp to work perfectly well on Windows phones and if you want to use C-sharp for mobile, you better please get a Windows phone. Okay? Now uh, this was a kind of struggle and it was an interesting time. But these, these open source guys, especially Miguel, um, they, yeah, they, they did their thing and they were successful. And at one point in time, Microsoft decided that Miguel was right. And open source is the way to go, and cross-platform is the way to go. And at that point in time, they open sourced C Sharp, the compiler, the common language runtime, and the whole framework. And with that, Mono became obsolete. There is no need for Mono anymore because Microsoft did what these guys, these rebels, did on their own. So is Mono a way? No, Mono is not a way. Mono is still there because of historical reasons. For instance, Unity uses Mono. You get the idea? But what they did is they have thrown away a lot of the code they have written over the years and replaced it with the original code from Microsoft that is now open source and now they are allowed to use it. A very important part in this game was that Microsoft got a new CEO, Chief Executive Officer. The old one? Was Bill, uh, the very old one was Bill Gates, but this is not in the times of Bill. Um, the Steve Ballmer was the CEO when it was like this, and then Satya Nadella came. He is the new CEO, had been CEO for a few years, and he made Microsoft a very, very open company, and he changed a lot of the policies. And now Miguel de Icaza, who was not a very welcomed person for Microsoft for many years, is now an employee of Microsoft and he is head of the .NET Foundation and is a super important person when it comes to the future of .NET. So this is how times change. It's a very interesting story and the, the open source and open world of, of using everything in Linux and Windows and so on, it won. If you ask me, the good guys won, not the bad guys. But that's just my opinion. And Xamarin became the product from all. So today you can use Xamarin, it's open source of course. There is a free version of Xamarin, but you also can buy a product, Xamarin. And Xamarin does cross-platform development. Cross-platform means that you use C-sharp, that you use C-sharp technology to build native apps. It's not a browser-based app like Cordova or Ionic. It's a native app. You build native code on Android and iOS. You use the native input box on Android and iOS. This is the concept of Xamarin. Yeah? Do you know any big apps that have been coded with Xamarin? I can't list you a number of apps. I know a lot of enterprise customers where I am, where I'm doing jobs, uh, who use Xamarin. I don't know any shiny big names. Please Google it. I'm sure you will find them. But if you take a look at the typical enterprise shop here in Austria, for instance, many of them use them. I can tell you why. Um, the big ones. The big ones who focus on mobile development. Let's say the Airbnbs, the Runtastic ones. They, have, they are focused on mobile development. And they can afford to build a dedicated iOS app and dedicated Android app or always follow the latest trend. They can't afford building the app today with React Native and six months after that they throw away React Native like Airbnb it did and rewrite everything with Flutter for instance. That's possible for a company whose sole purpose is to provide a great app. But most, most companies out there, in Austria for instance, their most important business is not selling an app. They are selling other products. Maybe they sell, I don't know, um, hardware devices, they sell furniture, they sell uh, consulting services, whatever, and the app is just one way of interacting with this company. Get the idea? And for them, they have, they always are in lack of developers. So they always have not enough developers, they always have not enough budget, and they can't afford to build three different apps for iOS, Android, and maybe another phone. 
and they can't afford to run behind every single trend and build it today like this and six months like that they throw it away and rebuild it. The, the last big company where I was involved into planning a completely new product, one of the first requirements that came on the table was the app must work for 10 years plus, at least 10 years without the major platform change. That's the reality in enterprise development. And therefore, for those companies, Xamarin is really nice because they can reuse existing skills, in short, there are a lot of new developers on the market, compare the number of .NET developers to the number of Flutter developers. How many professional Dart developers, Dart is the programming language for Flutter, do you know? I know one, he lives in Germany. How many .NET developers do I know? <laughs> A lot. There are, there are user groups, there are universities you learn .NET. So this is an important one. So if you ask for the big shiny names, you probably get disappointed. You will find some. But you will maybe be disappointed because you read the big ones. They create either native apps or use some, some crazy new technology. But this is not where you will probably end up um, working or maybe where you find a job. Because they are often sitting somewhere at the other end of the world or, well, maybe they are small startups. Okay. You get really good performance with Xamarin because it's a native app. It's not, not something like, like that. I don't, know, I don't need to discuss this picture. It's just a pictural description of what we talked. Down, down the bottom, you have the operating system. Then you have the implementation of .NET. You have this uh, CLR, which, which is a just-in-time compiler and things like that. You have the class library, and then you have the languages. I talked about .NET standards. You can create libraries on top of .NET standards. You can package them in NuGet. We'll talk about NuGet in the course of this course. You can create your apps on top. That's essentially a graphical description of what we talked about. And with that, we are done by talking about, we're talking about the basics of .NET. And this is exactly where I wanted to end. Because in a few minutes, I have to leave. I already told you that uh, I have to leave. We worked through the uh, big break, so you will now have a long break. Um, any questions regarding .NET or C-Sharp? General questions. No? Good. Very good. What will, we do, what will we do next time? Next time, we will switch gears and take a look at the language. I have an example, a larger example, an end-to-end -end example. I implemented a console version of Tetris, and we will work through more, more advanced concepts of C Sharp because I think the basics, what is a for loop and what is an if statement, I don't need to teach you that because you have learned that before and you've seen it in Java and TypeScript and C Sharp and so on. We'll go into more advanced concepts of C Sharp and next time we will start with exactly that. Please don't forget your homework. If you have any problems or questions, preparing the prerequisites of this course. Don't hesitate to send me an email or a GitHub issue. With that, I would like to close this lesson for today and wish you a nice week. We'll see each other next week. Okay? Thank you.